into my heart an air that kills from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? That is the land of lost content, I see it shining plain. Those happier highways where I went and cannot come again. At the start of the 20th century, British government planners were faced with a growing problem. Cities in the English Midlands, all with expanding populations, needed reliable and adequate supplies of fresh, clean and healthy drinking water. At the time, this need was addressed by creating the Howden and Upper Derwent dams. A number of farms and small holdings were compulsorily purchased. The farmers were then relocated to the villages of Derwent and Ashopton. The many workers who constructed the Howden and Upper Derwent dams were accommodated in a temporary town called Birchinley, better known to the locals as Tin Town, because nearly all the buildings were made out of corrugated iron. Tin Town existed between 1902 and 1916. The workers and their families lived there. There were hospitals, schools, a police station, and it was a, a functioning community until the work on the dams was over and it was deconstructed. However, by the mid 1930s, it was realized that flooding the northern half of the valley was only a temporary solution. So a plan was mooted, which involved flooding the rest of the valley, sacrificing the villages of Derwent and Ashopton in the process. During World War II, even as those villages were being prepared for a watery oblivion, the RAF's now famous 617 Squadron were flying their Lancaster bombers around the existing dams, practicing low flying and bomb aiming for their bouncing bomb raids on similar dams in Germany. Thanks to the magic of photography and digital imaging, we can cheat time and step back to take a brief look at probably the most interesting historical building lost to the floods. First built in 1672, Derwent Hall belonged to a succession of wealthy, powerful, entitled families. It was rebuilt extended and repurposed until by the early 1930s with the understanding that it was eventually going to end up under the Lady Bar Reservoir. It nominally belonged to the local authorities who used it to provide accommodation via the YMCA and other organisations for unemployed workers and folks that we'd now think of as student backpackers. Parts of Derwent Hall were saved from destruction. Some of its wooden panelling found its way to decorate the inside of local authority offices and buildings. The ancient pack bridge which stood before Derwent Hall was saved. It was dismantled stone by stone and reconstructed far to the north at a place called Slippery Stones, where it stands this very day. 
Occasionally, the water levels of the reservoir will fall, and a tantalising glimpse of the last pathetic remains of Doe and Tall are visible for a while. The church in Derwent Village saw its last, final and hurried service in 1944, after which the graves were emptied, the occupants were buried elsewhere, and demolition began. At first the church tower was allowed to stand and remain intact, where it served as a sort of landmark or memorial to the lost village. But eventually, the powers that be, the local authorities, decided it should be demolished. People were taking boat rides to explore the tower. Swimmers were even jumping from the windows and diving into the reservoir. So, in the name of safety, the Royal Engineers demolished the last remnant of Derwent Village. Collectors of ghost stories tell us that the bells of the destroyed and demolished tower can be heard ringing under the water on stormy nights, although the bells were in fact removed and gifted to another church in the county. Take a good look at these children, all of them dead, all of them carried away by time's ever rolling stream. Here they are, dressed in their Sunday best, posing for a photograph that you are looking at decades, generations later. Golden lads and girls almost, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Most of them would have spent their entire lives in the village. They would have been born, grown up, married, had children of their own, grown old and been laid to rest in the churchyard at Ash Hopton. Some of the boys were probably victims of England's foreign wars and they still lie overseas in foreign fields that are forever England. Yet the ones who were laid to rest in their native soil were eventually scoured up from the ground and reburied elsewhere in places they never knew in life. Join me in part two where I'll be showing you some more images of these lost villages and also focusing on the ghost stories attached to this haunted region.